sorry. This is great. So as long as you keep coming, I'll keep coming and be here. So I'm going to be here next Wednesday night. Uh, and rather than having six, we, we'll have at least seven. And I don't know, there might even be a full eight by the time we're all done. But we will stop after the end of July, however, however far we get. So uh, if you already made plans, I understand that. And please keep your plans. But we will have session next week uh, here together. So tonight we're on seminar four, and there's plenty of room for everybody. And uh, I, I keep reminding us of some things we talked about our very first session together, that rather than using only religious language, we're using the language of the academic world, the secular language, uh, the language of the workplace. Uh, and I can't help but chuckle to myself that if I were giving these lectures in an academic setting, minus direct religious references, they'd still say they're too religious. And by giving them in a religious setting, someone is always saying they're too academic or too scientific or something like that. Uh, and again, that's because we're taking both and putting them together because that's the nature of the universe. It's really the visible and the invisible uh, together. So we come this evening and we're going to start this process uh, again. There on, on your first page of your notes, be page 71, looking at ancient stories. And again, this is a front porch introduction to our topic that we're going to discuss this evening. And for those of you that are coming in late, there's still plenty of seats down here, so just come on in and, and, and get in. Ancient stories are often called myths. And it comes from the Greek word mouvo. Uh, which means to close the mouth, the shh. And from this word, another word comes into existence. Did it have an A? Which is mysterion, which is translated a mystery, a secret. And if you, it means a secret that shh. Don't tell the secret that we were doing this for. But if you make this into our alphabet, you can almost see it already. And it's where our word mystery is going to come from, mysterion, the, the secret. And then the verb uh, mueo, meaning to tell someone the secret, to initiate them into whatever the secret is that is being guarded. And then when that secret is part of a story, is embedded in a story, uh, that story with the secret is a muthos, where our word myth comes from. In a technical use of the word, uh, a myth is not fiction. And a myth is not a tall tale, nor is it a fable. So I'm wanting us to kind of be technical here for just a little bit. Uh, instead, myths are a literary genre for remembering vital knowledge. Uh, for example, if I were to ask you in the children's story about the little pigs, how many little pigs are there? Three. Everybody knows there's three little pigs. And when was the last time you read the story? Unless you've got grandchildren and you read it last week. For most of us, it may have been several years. But isn't it amazing? We all know there are three little pigs. And we won't take the time, but if I ask you, and had you write it down, we would all know the first little pig built his house out of the second little pig out of? And the third little pig out of? 100%. How in the world can we remember something? Like, it's because it's a story and the information is embedded in it. And when it's repeated enough times, 
you can't separate the story from the information and you remember the information and you might even know the secret. And the secret would be that when you're building your life, don't build it out of straw and sticks, but out of sturdy moral ethical stuff would be the secret embedded in the little story. Uh, myths are, are often an explanation for events or human behavior. And more often than not, a myth contains a historical memory of actual events. I want to mention three of these. Just All of this is front porch, just to get us going. Uh, to, Golly, I don't know, wake up. Uh, let's talk about Agamemnon and the Trojan War. Who? We've got members from the Greek parish here. They know Agamemnon and the Trojan War, of course. And if you've been to the movies in the last three or four or five years, was it Brad Pitt who made the, the, the Trojan War, came into existence all over again? But the story is told by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And for... What, 1,800 years? Add another 800 on it for Homer. 2,600 years? Everybody believed it was part of the greatest fiction ever written in the history of the world. There was absolutely no Helen, no Agamemnon, Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra. There was no battle. There was no horse. There were no Greeks hidden inside. It was just a fabulous story until in 1873 Heinrich Schliemann a German amateur archaeologist made his fortune in engineering or something I don't know but he loved the Iliad and he said I bet it's true so he had the money to go on a whim and went and following the clues in the Iliad, hired a bunch of guys, gave them a shovel, said start digging, and they did, and they found the ancient city of Troy. Actually found about six buildings, six or seven of them on top of each. But they found it. Well, if Troy existed, then maybe the citadel of Mycenae, where Agamemnon's fortress was, also existed. There really might have been an Agamemnon. So then Schliemann hurries over to Greece, hires the diggers, follows the clues embedded inside of the Iliad, and discovers Mycenae and the Lion Gate. I would show you my picture of the Lion Gate, but I had one of those ancient cameras. Of course, I'm an ancient guy, so I should have an ancient camera. <laughs> And when I took the picture, in those days you had to manually roll the film forward. Some of you remember maybe. And I had taken a picture and didn't roll it, so my picture of the Lion Gate is on top of another picture. A hard lesson to learn. <laughs> anyway, he found the Lion Gate. He found Mycenae. He dug up the royal graves and found a gold death mask. Thin, like made out of aluminum foil, and pressed upon the face of the dead king so that the features of the dead man are visible through the gold and believed he was looking at the face of Agamemnon. When I stood in the museum in downtown Athens and stood looking at that death mask, I believed I was looking at Agamemnon. Now, later scholars have said maybe it was a different king or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He might as well be Agamemnon. He was one of them that, that was there. But the point is, he found the place. And then just down off of the citadel, there's this steep road that gets up to the top of the citadel on this peak, as it were, is the beehive tube embedded in the side of this other hill. And that's Clytemnestra's tomb. And uh, maybe you've read uh, Aeschylus' play uh, where uh, Agamemnon finally comes home from the Trojan War and Clytemnestra is going to assassinate him. Uh, 
uh, in her anger over events that had happened prior to the beginning of, oh, no, 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 no. The point of it is, there really was a historical Agamemnon, there really was a historical Clytemnestra, there really was the historical war that we're talking about. And there, I think, on page 73, there's at least a little map for you to look at that, that kind of just shows you we're looking at the Mediterranean world and you've got Troy up here and you've got Mycenae down here in the Peloponnesus and we're going to talk about Crete down here at the very bottom in a, in a minute or, or, or so. And if you were to flip the page again, we've even got the death mask of... Agamemnon, and we'll put a quotation marks around that. I just want you to see that we live in a world today that is myopic, is nearsighted, and is getting close to having cultural uh, Alzheimer's disease. We only live in the now, and we think everything else that ever happened is fiction. And it's simply not so. That's the whole point I'm making in this introduction. The past really happened. And so Agamemnon really lived. And his wife Clytemnestra lived and was buried. Now she may not have ended up being buried in this tomb after her son Orestes then kills her because he avenges his father's death because his mother killed the father of Agamemnon. I don't know if she was, but it was built for her. Anyway, so we, we, we have, well this led to a whole other story to be examined then on page 76, uh, the island of Crete and the myth of the Minotaur, the half man, half bull creature that lived at the center of the labyrinth. Uh, and uh, every uh, year Minnow demanded that the Athens send him seven boys and seven girls as a tribute that were fed to the Minotaur every nine years. Maybe every nine years from Athens they have to send these 14 young people there and, and so forth. And eventually Theseus volunteers to go and, and uh, Ariadne falls in love with him and helps him betray her father by showing him how to kill the Minotaur and get out and on and on and on and on. This was not as good a fiction as the Iliad had been thought to be, but it was a knee slapper of fiction because of the tension of uh, uh, the Athenians with the people on the island of Crete, the Cretans, you know, the, and so forth. So in all of Greek history, there existed absolutely no other King Minnow on Crete, no mention of Minnow or any of this. There was no memory of there ever being any kind of culture or civilization on the island. None. Until a British guy by the name of Sir Arthur Evans, deciding that he didn't want Schliemann to have all the fun, who also had a lot of money, then let's go to Crete and just look around. So he goes there in 1894, goes, hmm, this is promising. So he comes back loaded with money and workers. They arrive and start digging on March the 23rd, 1900. I'm giving you real dates because it's real history. And on April the 13th, 1900, they found the throne room of a King Minnow that no one in the whole world ever knew existed. The Libris, from which Labyrinth comes, means a double-headed axe, it's spelled there in our notes, which was used as a scepter or symbol of royal power. And Arthur Evans found the throne room of King Minnow. The eruption of the island of Thera, now known as Santorini, that volcano in 1450, BC destroyed the Minoan culture, created a tsunami so powerful that it washed across the northern Egypt, northern Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. And there on page 77, by the way, I showed you a picture of the labyrinth. The labyrinth is this huge maze of a complicated building. If you've ever been to the Veterans <laughs> Hospital, <laughs> Do you understand how a building is a labyrinth? 
And as they keep building on mercy over here, it's becoming one quickly too. It, but the last time I was at uh, the Veterans Hospital, the VA, they, they had painted feet on the lines to follow or something. If you're headed here, follow the yellow brick road or the blue one or the green one. It was, and, and so item number one is got an arrow on it over there. I put a star by it to let you see the throne room. And then if you flip the page there at the top is a picture of the vacant throne room now. And below it are going to be some of the frescoes of some of the women of the court that are found on the walls among them. And if you flip the page again on page 79, this would have been the throne room. And here's the throne that was there. It's carved out of marble or rock of some sort. And the women frescoes that are, that are there. You will see the fresco of the bull leaping, where the acrobat grabs the bull by the horns at the front and then flips and somersaults across his back and ends at the other uh, side of the bull. The celebration of the bull, uh, a symbol of the Minoan culture uh, that is found, not only found in Crete, but they have in the last 10 years in northern Egypt excavated at Avaris and have found the same fresco there. The Minoan culture was this huge unknown culture that dominated the eastern Mediterranean Sea and no one knew it existed until 1900 when Evans dug it up. That wasn't long ago, okay? Well, now let me mention one thing. I'm just trying to mention stuff that you would have said were fairy tales. And I'm trying to show to you that there's historical memory embedded in the story. Well, how about Jason and the Argonauts and the Golden Fleece? Oh, now you're stretching it. I know. You know, he's going to sail from the Peloponnesus. They're going to go in through the Dardanelles into the Black Sea, which used to be an extremely dangerous sea and are going to go to the uh, land of Colchis where they're going to uh, steal this golden fleece, fleece covered with gold. Well, the cities of ancient Colchis have not yet been found and the archaeologists have not yet been able to excavate them. But within this century, People from National Geographic and others have been in the area and have written their stories on it that the people in this region of Colchis, which is in the Republic of Georgia, up in the mountains, they still take a ram skin, put it in the fast moving water of the rivers, and the gold flecks in the river stick to the skin. And at a certain point, they pull it forth, let the skin dry, shake it, and they've got harvested their gold nuggets. They're panning for gold the same way they've always panned for gold in these rivers using sheepskins. There is an island on the southern edge of the Black Sea that every year at a certain time has the festival celebrating Jason and the Golden Fleece because Jason in the legend stopped at that island and they still commemorate the fact that he stopped at their island on his way to get this fleece and so forth. And there on the bottom of, of page 8 of item C it is likely the golden fleece existed earlier in this century remote mountain villagers in Svaneti a part of ancient Colchis were observed using sheepskins to trap the fine gold particles in the rivers that flowed from the Caucasus mountains the skins would then be dried and beaten to shake out their contents. Okay, maybe I've softened you up with this artillery barrage to make it possible now to begin to explore our biological and historical ancestors. I mean, after you've been beaten up in our Western culture, for however long you've been alive, being told all of this is fake and fable and so forth, it is a stretch to begin looking at the reality of the historical and biological ancestors that we possess. All modern humans are descendants 
of a single founder population. They are not fictional creatures. They existed. They had children who in turn had children. Every one of us is related to them genetically. We each share their DNA. Our Neolithic ancestors were historical people, not mythological people. They are historical people who lived in a particular place at a particular time. They're not just kind of floating around in the air somewhere. Well, when did they live? Well, let's talk about the Younger Dryas event. By 12,500 BC, the last ice age, you saw the Kitty movie Ice Age, right? So we're all current with this. <laughs> the last ice age was in rapid retreat. Deglaciation of the northern hemisphere was nearly complete when a dramatic cooling occurred that almost led to reglaciation. This cold episode, known as the Younger Dryas event, lasted a thousand years, from 9,000 BC to 8,000 BC. The event began with a sudden 45 to 50 degree Fahrenheit drop in temperature and ended with a drastic warm up of the same magnitude. We have been having global warming in a sense ever since. Ever since the glaciers began melting, then they got re cold here for this thousand year period, and since then, we warm back up and periodically the earth has, has warmed. A large variety of animals went extinct during the Younger Dryas event. Nearly all mammals in the Northern Hemisphere, weighing 100 pounds or more, became extinct. Saber-toothed cats, mammoths, and mastodons are among the best known examples. That's why you do not have in the Northern Hemisphere the size of animals that you have in the African continent. They used to be here, but they died, went extinct during this cold period known as the Younger Dryas event. And again, I'm using scientific stuff and I'm quoting these scientists that are there. Whatever pre-human species, remember there were 15 wannabes running around or something, that may have existed prior to the Neolithic Revolution, they also became extinct during the Younger Dryas event. But with the sudden 50 degree rise in temperature in 8000 BC, the Younger Dryas event ended Global warming began and the glaciers once more began to melt. As the glaciers melted, they left behind a single founder population of modern humans. We were here. So we have a date for us. 8,000 BC, a single founder population of us. Not human wannabes, not human maybes, but what the scientists call modern humans were suddenly here. Or another piece of evidence on the next page. Let's just talk about blue eyes. Anybody got blue eyes in the room? We got a few. Good, yeah, okay, good. Let's talk about you for just a second. Researchers in Denmark have found that every person with blue eyes descends from just one founder, an ancestor whose genes mutated 6,000 to 10,000 years ago. Oops, but help me out. 10,000 years ago would have been what date? 8,000 B.C. Over time, the researchers were able to trace the blue eye trait to one specific area near a gene called the OCA2. And Iberg's team tested 155 blue eyed people from Scandinavia, Turkey, Jordan, in, and India, looking to see whether they too had similar DNA sequences on that gene. To their amazement, they found that each individual had identical DNA sequences in that region of the gene an indication the original mutation happened recently enough that it hasn't had time to change. We're not talking about needing billions of years plus time plus chance. 
We're talking 10,000 years ago. We're here. Okay. That one mutation now exists in an estimated 300 million people. And no telling how many of the rest of us carry it in us. But it's recessive and just didn't show up. Just, there. just looking at the stuff. Okay. A time frame. 8,000 B.C. as a maximum edge of Baptists. Where did they live? Well, the obvious looking point is the Fertile Crescent. At the east end of, the Mes of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, the land between the seas. Uh, if, if this is Turkey and the Mediterranean, we're looking over here, the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia, land between the, the rivers. This area here begins to be of great attention. In the past hundred years, since the discovery of ancient civilization, we've only known about them for a hundred years or so. Nobody knew they were there, except uh, they began finding them like during the American Civil War, 1860s and so forth. In the past hundred years, since the discovery of ancient civilizations in modern Iraq, Scholars have leaned toward the Tigris-Euphrates Valley in general. Archaeologist Jiris Sarens, an expert on Arabia, believes he has located the site of the Garden of Eden. After years of research, he believes that the Garden of Eden lies which presently under the waters of the Persian Gulf, and he further believes that the story of Adam and Eve in and especially out of the Garden is a highly condensed and evocative account of perhaps the greatest revolution that ever shook mankind, the shift from hunter-gathering to being agriculture. Well, the mountains north of the Fertile Crescent, rather than the Persian Gulf, others place the Garden of Eden at the other end of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in the mountains of eastern Turkey and western Iran, near where the headwaters of the two rivers begin. The ancient region of Eden would have existed in what was later known as Armenia, situated in eastern Turkey, western Iran, south of and between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. On today's map, the south of the they would be south of the city of Tabriz, between Lake, Lake Urmia and Mount Sehan. As a, a place. Now let's, let's play our own Indiana Jones and go looking for just a second. All right. Let's talk about Inmarkar and the Lord of Arata. <coughs> Inmarkarm, the Lord of Arata, is an ancient Sumerian story. Copies of the story exist since about 2100 BC. That's 4100 years ago. But the story is much older than the extant copies. Inmarkar is the second ruler of Uruk. It's a city where the word Iraq comes from. He's the second ruler of Iraq after the flood, according to the Sumerian king list. This Inmarkar sent an emissary to Arata to get gold and lapis lazuli with which to decorate a new temple being built to the goddess Inanna. The emissary traveled through the Zagros Mountains by going through seven mountain passes called Seven Gates before arriving at the seventh heaven of Arata which was located on a plain at the base of Mount Sion. Line 351 of the story, Inmarkar and the Lord of Arata, describes how the emissary arrived in Arata unopposed, having crossed the plain like a huge serpent prowling about in the plain. The composite text, which is a transliteration of the cuneiform into our alphabet provided by the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature for line 351 is, now there it is in our alphabet. Yeah, right. Helps me a lot. But notice the beginning of the second word above. I made it bold. Do you see it? You got an um kum gal, and then you hit e d i n. The Sumerian word for plain is Eden. The emissary traveled unopposed across Eden, across the plain of Eden. Now let's talk about a man by the name David Rowe. In much the same way that Heinrich Schliemann used Homer's Iliad to locate ancient Troy and Mycenae, using Inmarkar and the Lord of Arata, that text, archaeologist David Rowe set out to find the plain of Eden. 
beginning near the northern end of the Persian Gulf, rolled traveled northwestwardly through the seven gates of the Zagros Mountains, through Iranian Kurdistan, into a fertile valley known today as the Ajiche, between Lake Urmia and Mount Sehon. The Hebrew word for garden used in the Garden of Eden is Gan, which has the meaning of walled or enclosed garden. <coughs> The enclosed valley of the Ajiche is just that, a rich soil, paradisical, paradisical haven protected by high mountain walls. The Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, calls the Garden of Eden Paradise, Paradisos, after the ancient Persian term Paradisa, meaning enclosed parkland. David Roll made the journey to Eden several times. On one occasion, he returned with television crews from the Discovery Channel and the BBC. Peter Martin accompanied Roll on his third trip. Martin's account appeared in the Sunday Times. After a 700 mile drive from Awaz and southwest of Iran, we came out at the northern end of the Zagros Mountains into the Azerbaijan province and down on the Minyoda Plain, where barren foothills, black dotted with an occasional Bedouin tent, had suddenly given way to, there's no other way to say it, an earthly paradise of large wall gardens right and left, and a profusion of orchards heavy with every kind of fruit, apples, pears, grapes, melon, maize cobs, and tomatoes. Following a document, it's 4,100 years old, it led them to this vast plain where there's lush stuff growing to this day. Just making this thing just a second. Hard as the Dickens to do this because they aren't real. Adam and Eve couldn't have lived. They couldn't be somewhere. They're just a figment of somebody's imagination. But there might be such a place. Hmm. Biologically, genetically, we came from a single founder? Hmm. Well, what did they do? This is known as the Neolithic Revolution and the study of humanities. At the end of the Younger Dryas event, our ancestors, living in a protected valley in the north end of the Zagros Mountains, did something that no other species on this planet has ever done. They domesticated animals. They began to have animals. They no longer hunted animals, if they ever did. They now raised animals. And suddenly they had a stable food supply. And they became nomadic, allowing themselves to live in tents and follow the sheep and the goats and the cattle. And as the sheep and the goats and the cattle wandered, they wandered with them. But they always had something to eat. And the minute they had something to eat, they ensured their own survival and the survival of their children and their grandchildren and be fruitful and multiply, kicked in like crazy. And we began to populate greater than any other biological species on this planet. We have conquered the planet in only 10,000 years. No other species like us on the... We're pretty special. And I don't mind saying so. We are special. This species is a special species, unlike any other species, us on this planet. And the great symbol of the domestication of animals is the bull. The bull became the great symbol across Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, and the ancient world. The Minoan culture that thrived on Crete from 3000 to 1450 for 1500 years created the frescoes of the bull. We've already seen that fresco. Uh, the gymnastic event of the pommel horse may well be a memory of jumping over the back of the bull. Uh, long after the death of the Minoan culture, you have the myth of the Minotaur, this bull civilization that they had helped overthrow, and the, the frescoes of bull leaping 
have been discovered in a virus in northern Egypt, as I've already mentioned. And 10,000 years later, us, the historical memory of the taming of the bull is commemorated unknowingly in Pamplona, Spain, with the running of the bulls done every, what, every spring, and with bullfights throughout Hispanic cultures in Europe and the Americas, and bull riding is the feature event at rodeos across the United States, and we are home right here in Oklahoma City to Bull Manza. Still celebrating 10,000 years later, taunting this bull that we have finally mastered in the domestication of animals. But they not only domesticated animals, our Neolithic ancestors domesticated crops. They went from having a stable food supply to having an abundant food supply. They not only had the food to feed themselves, they could really now feed the animals. And because they could do this, if you're going to plant a crop, you've got to stay put. We were no longer nomadic, we became sedentary. We had to watch the crop grow, we had to till it, we had to weed it, we had to harvest it, we had to... And our wives looked at us and said, you know, I'm tired of this tent. How about something a little more permanent since we're not moving? An architecture is going to be born. The great symbol of the domestication of crops. The consequences of becoming farmers are staggering. They needed shelter and invented permanent housing. Architecture is born. With an abundance of food, Neolithic farmers experienced a population boom. There were now more people that needed, there were now more people than was needed to go work in the, in the fields. There was also now time. No longer spending all of their time searching for food, farmers turned their attention to inventing writing, creating music and art, and telling stories. In short, culture was born. All culture is dependent upon agriculture. At first towns and then cities were created. With cities came politics, governments, and empires. While the bull is the great symbol of the domestication of animals, the city is the great symbol of the domestication of crops. The crowning achievement of settling down is the city. Without the farmer, there would be no cities. We don't all have to live on the farm and raise the, raise the stuff. So everybody leaves the farm and goes where? to the cities. And what do we do here? All the other stuff that's human. We create art. We create literature. We create music. We create sculpture. We create buildings. We figure out electricity. Look at what we, whether you like what we've done or not, is a separate judgment. Look at what has happened in this. We've got somebody, something, some device taking pictures on Mars tonight. There is no other species on the planet gifted like us. And we didn't get here until 10 times. We didn't get here 500 million years ago. Get over it. <laughs> we got here in 8,000 B.C. in a protected valley in the north end of the Zagros Mountains. Gosh, what a story. Sorry, I get excited about this <laughs> If the domestication of crops is the greatest event that ever happened, let's talk about the greatest invention that ever happened. The movement from small-scale gardening to full-scale gardening required the greatest invention in human history, the calendar. If I were to ask you the question, when do you plant potatoes? in Oklahoma. Those of you that are gardeners would have probably said all around St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. If you lived in Waco, Texas, and I asked you, when do you plant your potatoes? You would have said at Valentine's Day. 
You see, 300 miles horizontally on the planet doesn't make a whole lot of difference agriculturally. If rainfall and all that's the same. But 300 miles north and south, it's a lot colder here on February the 14th normally than it is in Waco, Texas. You can't plant on February the 14th, but you can in March, a month later. And if you're in Wichita, it's going to be probably a month later and on up the Great Plains. And maybe you've been seeing the, the news accounts lately that all of these schedules are having to be revised because of some global warming going on. And spring is arriving earlier, the frost is leaving earlier, and the growing season starts earlier before it gets too hot in the summer and kills the crops and so forth. The first calendars, when they would have looked at it, to the sky would have been the moon. In fact, the word moon comes from their word for measurement, and our word month comes from the word moon. And so those first calendars were lunar, that they didn't work for agriculture because the sun, us going around the sun, we now know doesn't work that way. But the lunar calendar became the, the basis of all business calendars. We pay our bills on a monthly basis. We send out a bill and are due in 30 days, thereabouts. So the lunar calendar to this very day governs the business cycles that we go through. They finally discovered the solar cycles and discovered that you needed a solar calendar for agriculture. And it's even embedded in those opening verses of Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And so they became astronomers looking to the sky at night using the stars and the circulation of them year after year to begin to create a solar calendar that's even then mentioned in the verses of, of Genesis there that we're going to put the stars in place because they're going to be used as your calendar. While the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Okay, I've got to hurry. Now let's talk about the historical memory of that first farmer. There on page 88. The story of Adam and Eve, as found in the Bible, presents a religious understanding of the historical beginnings of the Neolithic man. I'm going to get to the religious side of all of this, but I want you to see that from a secular academic side, these people, when I went off to college and said, there is no Adam and Eve, they weren't just saying there's no religious side to the story, they were saying there is no historical side to the story. It was a lie. There is the history of the founders of us. Our great ancestors are extremely important people. And the only name that exists for them is only found in the story of Genesis. So we're going to call them Adam and Eve because we don't have any other name to call them. It's the only place that we have this memory of the name. In one other reference we're going to look at in just a second. I just want you to see, they existed. You're going to get to make up your mind in a minute how they got here. That's part two. <laughs> the historical realities upon which the story of Adam and Eve is based exist independently from the religious understanding of that history. The same is true for ancient stories in general. For ancient stories were not created simply to transmit facts, but to transmit their understanding of those facts. The historicity of the facts does not in and of itself authenticate any interpretation or understanding of those facts. We're just trying to establish it happened. And unfortunately, I can't go dig them up like Schliemann did, Troy, or like Evans did, 
minnow. I don't have Adam's death mask to show you. But I can show you from all these other disciplines that we've looked at across the board that something happened 8,000 years ago that had never happened before on this planet. And it's us. And we're part of this us that we're talking about here. For example, in seminar two, I shared with you some very personal events out of my life. Those events happen. I also shared with you my interpretation, my understanding of those events that God was trying to interrupt my life and get my attention. If you were a skeptic, you would at least have to admit the events happened. Assuming I'm not a liar and inventive. But you could have said it was just a coincidence. So the events are subject to two different understandings. One is, it was God interrupting my life, and the other one is coincidence. But the events happen. That's what I'm wanting to stress to us. These events happen regardless of what understanding you want to give the event. The understanding that is given to the event is a matter of belief. Either we believe that God did and caused this event, or we believe that a virus flew in from Mars and infected a species, or that matter plus time plus chance did it. That is a matter of belief. Not biology, not history, not archaeology, but the event is a matter of history. It is a matter of archaeology. It is a matter of biology. It is here, the event. And that's what we're looking at for just a second. Whether one accepts or rejects a religious understanding of Adam and Eve is a matter of one's own belief, but a discussion of the historical memory contained within the story of Adam and Eve is not a religious discussion. It is a historical discussion of our Neolithic ancestors. Adam, and now I'm quoting an archaeologist, his point of view, he says, Adam is a metaphor for the oldest ancestor in memory. The first historical man, the head of a genealogy, a spiritual and political leader in one. He is also the representative of the first settled people, a former hunter-gatherers, who through the Neolithic Revolution learned to domesticate animals and to plant crops. Adam with Eve were the founding family of civilization. The story of Adam and Eve is a Semitic version that originated in Mesopotamia. It shares parallel features found in Sumerian and Babylonian creation stories. There are two versions of Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, found in the Semitic tradition. There is the account found in Genesis and the account found in the Jewish Sudipagrapha in the book of Jubilees. Uh, we're all familiar with Genesis, so I'm looking at the book of Jubilees just for a second with us. According to the book of Jubilees, which is a Jewish book, Adam and Eve were created in the land of Elda and then moved to the Garden of Eden. In the garden they ate plants yielding seed and the fruit of trees. When they were hungry they harvested whatever food was available to them. But according to the story they quickly moved from foraging to gardening, hence a garden of Eden. Adam and Eve became cultivators of the garden. According to the book of Jubilees it was God who taught Adam how to farm. And Adam became the first farmer. Adam and Eve had been in the Garden of Eden for seven years, tilling and reaping. He was given work and instructed how to farm correctly. That's a direct quote from the book of Jubilees. After eight years in the Garden of Eden, on the new moon of the fourth month, Adam and his wife left the Garden of Eden and dwelled in the land of Elda, in the land of their creation. Now he farmed the land as he had been instructed to in the Garden of Eden. A direct declaration in these books that Adam is the first farmer, the first one to domesticate crops, 
the first one to allow an abundant food supply to feed his children and to allow them to be fruitful and multiply to take place. And all of the stuff that's happened to his descendants are because we alone among all species can control a food supply. Historically, at the very least, if you want to say nothing else, our Neolithic ancestors, part of a dwindling population group, to quote the scientists, found refuge in a protected area flush with readily harvested fruits and vegetables. While there, they discovered how to till the ground, plant seeds, and grow and harvest food. They left the safety of their protected garden and returned to the land of their origin as farmers. The Neolithic Revolution had begun. Genetically, at the very least, all modern humans are descendants of this Neolithic single founder population who were the first farmers. All other pre-human species starved to death and failed to survive genetically. The historical memory of our Neolithic ancestors who invented farming survives embedded in the story of Adam and Eve. If you are non-religious and remove every religious element out of the story, you have to, at the very least, admit item number two, the historicity of the event, and item number three, the genetics of this very event. Even if God's not in the picture, Adam and Eve are. Our great-grandparents existed. Well, that's a good stuff. <laughs> Now we'll come back after the break to talk about what I believe. Thanks. That when you begin reading different sources, and they're all out there, and the majority of the sources that I have been reading and citing in our sessions are not Christian sources and are not religious sources. They would be the leading edge. And it makes a difference if you're dealing with the neo-evolutionists who are dealing with the DNA and so forth. And they all, the new science that has completely replaced the, the old, are talking about some sort of population bottleneck. And if they've heard of the Younger Dryas event, that understand that's what this event is here, and that all of the human wannabes, things that somehow to the scientists fit into a broad classification of being human. And so we use that word for us, we're humans. But to the scientists, we're a homo sapiens sapien. Boy, that's narrowed it down. And then they throw in modern in front of that. And when they do that, and it is a difference of whether you're talking about back here, these are paleo uh, ontologists. Paleo ontologists are never wrong because you can never disprove whatever they say. <laughs> that can look at scratches on a bone and tell you it's anything and create a theory out of it simply because whatever's there left no historical record, no writing. There is a major break between the Paleolithic Old Age and Neo Gosh, I feel like Indiana Jones. <laughs> Neolithic. And the Neolithic comes out here in 8,000 B.C. Regardless of whatever was or was not back here, this is new. 
the Neolithic, and when we looked at in our, if either our, our second session, I think, when we were quoting Pinker, who's this high-powered guy at MIT, talking about coming out, and suddenly we invented, we invented agriculture and had a population explosion and bred buku copies of the genes that were available, and that's us. There has not been enough time, genetically speaking, for there to be genetic change. We are a small species, meaning genetically. That's why I had that citation of all ago about the blue eyes. There's no other, there's no change. It's happened in the last 8,000 years to 10,000 years, and there's simply been no time for genetic change and variables to have come in. We didn't exist prior to here as we are now. That's the whole point. It doesn't matter what the paleontologists say, and it doesn't matter what till they get beyond us right here. Now they may change the date and say, well, it was actually 9,000. Big deal. The point is, this Neolithic event dates to there. And it dates to us being there then. That's the whole part of that. Okay. Page 90. Christ did not save a metaphor. The historical data, the biological data, the agricultural data, everything says there's a single founder population in 8,000 B.C. You can either believe God had a hand in that, or you can believe a virus infected some human wannabe species and it mutated itself into us, or that you take human matter, us, plus time, plus chance, and here we are. Those are belief choices. And the title of this course is These Things I Believe. What I believe and why I believe them. I believe there is a historical Adam and Eve. I've just spent an hour documenting that to us from all the information out there. And I've not mentioned any religious source to back it up. Now I want to say what I believe religiously. Quoting our Vesper service. Let creation rejoice. Let the heavens cheer. Let the nations clap their hands for joy. For Christ, our Savior, to the cross has nailed our sins. And having slain death and raised up Adam, the progenitor of mankind, hath granted us life, for he loveth mankind. I believe that Adam is the progenitor of mankind. That he is our great, great, great granddaddy. <coughs> king of earth, king of heaven and earth, O inscrutable creator, thou who for the love of mankind was of thy free will crucified, having met thee below, Hades was vexed, while the souls of the righteous on receiving thee were gladdened, and Adam, seeing thee, the creator, in the nethermost parts, rose again. I believe that Christ, being God, came and died to kill death. And they went into Hades, and while there he met Adam. Not a metaphor, but the actual founder, popular father of us and brought him out of hell when he came. O oh, wonder how the life of all hath tasted death by his own will, to enlighten the world that crieth, saying, O thou who didst rise from the dead, O Lord, glory to thee. 
The company of the angels was amazed when they beheld thee numbered among the dead, yet thyself, O Savior, destroying the power of death, and with thee raising up Adam, and releasing all men from hell. St. Basil's liturgy, his prayer of the Anaphorah. When thou hadst created man, and hadst fashioned him from the dust of the earth, and hadst honored him with thine own image, O God, Thou didst set him in the midst of a paradise of plenty, promising him life eternal and the enjoyment of everlasting good things and keeping thy commandments. But when he disobeyed thee, the true God, who had created him and was led astray by the guile of the serpent and rendered subject to death through his own transgressions, thou didst banish him and thy righteous judgment, O God, from paradise into this present world and didst turn him again to the earth free, from which he was taken, providing for him the salvation of regeneration, which is in thy Christ. Yet thou didst not turn thyself away forever from the, it should be thy, thy creature, who thou hast made, O good one. <clears throat> Neither didst thou forget the work of thy hands, but thou didst visit him in divers manners through the tender compassion of thy mercy. And when the fullness of time was come, thou didst speak unto us through thy Son himself, by whom also thou madest the ages. But albeit he was God before all the ages, yet he appeared upon earth and dwelt among men and was incarnate of a holy virgin, and did empty himself, taking on the form of a servant, and becoming conformed to the fashion of our lowliness, that he might make us conformable to the image of his glory, that they who were dead in Adam might be made alive in thy Christ, even in our funeral service. Thy creating command was my origin and my foundation, for it was thy pleasure to fashion me out of nature visible and invisible, a living creature. From the earth thou didst shape my body and didst give me a soul by thy divine and quickening breath. Wherefore, O Christ, give rest to thy servant in the land of the living, in the habitation of the just. And from Scripture, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. It is the gospel of the church that mankind is a unit. You could call us the Neolithic species if we want to use a scientific label for us. Us, the special wonderful species that has domesticated animals, domesticated crops, and has created all that we see around us. We have become fools in our heart. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We have forgotten our God, and we have blocked ourselves into these boxes of our own understanding. And yet the day will come when every one of us is going to face death. The punishment of what happened between Adam and Eve and God is mortality. We're going to get to the subject of salvation either next week or the week after, and we will see it from a different point of view than the Calvinistic understanding that we have so prevalent here in the West. The issue is not hell. The issue is death. Every verse we've read so far since we've come back from the break has talked about being rescued, Adam being released from the netherworld, and being rescued from death. The issue is death. The issue facing our species is death. And while we have invented agriculture 
and have sustained our species and our lives with a superabundance of food. It makes death out there on the margins, and yet death is the reality that we are going to face and the question of the purpose of our lives. And it is the statement of Christianity that God became flesh in order that we might become like God. That God was in Christ reconciling us to Him. And that the species, though huge in number, is yet a single species with a single human nature. It is not a nature that is possessed by any other species on this planet. And this species, God has chosen to love and is the only lover of this species, the only lover of mankind. And the entire gospel message is larger than us. We live in a narcissistic, individualistic world. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's my personal salvation. It's my, 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 me, 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 my needs, my attention. And God is saving the species. God loves this species. God has intended something for this species. We are created and we will get to that for a goal and a purpose. And we've not yet achieved. The goal and purpose for why God did something on our planet, counting in our years, 10,000 years ago. It is a great gospel. We can't get it all in in one night. We're just having to walk to get there. But I want you to know, and it, it, we have a beginning. There is a first Adam. And because there is a first Adam who did not achieve, and therefore we, his kids, have not achieved what we were created for, the second Adam came not to spank us, but to rescue us. And to allow us the opportunity to be rescued. How shall we escape if we ignore and neglect so great a salvation, it says in the book of Hebrews. And so when I turn to page 92, I see there the icon of the resurrection. We in the East celebrate a different date for Easter than in the West, so we're still in the 40 days following the resurrection. We're still singing all of our Easter music and our Easter hymns, and we'll do so th through next Wednesday, which will be the 40-day period, the Feast of the Ascension. And when you look at this icon, we see Christ standing over the shattered gates of hell. We see the souls chained in, in Hades are there. But we see in particular Christ, the resurrected Savior, reaching down to Adam and reaching down to Eve, rescuing them and redeeming them from death and offering that rescue from death to all of the rest of us that will accept it, that will accept the message of salvation in our lives. That icon happens to be in the apse of our sanctuary. And if you're in our sanctuary, Sunday after Sunday, sitting in the right location so the iconostasis doesn't block it, you see Adam and Eve being rescued from death by the risen Savior. He is not rescuing a metaphor. He is not rescuing a human wannabe. And to the skeptic, if Adam and Eve are metaphors, then so is Christ. 
And they deny the resurrection, they deny the incarnation, they deny it all because they count by fours or fives or tens or whatever system they count by and they create their answers that has no need for God, no place for God, and they live their lives trapped in those boxes we've already been speaking about. Adam and Eve really lived. Adam and Eve really lived somewhere on this planet. They are the founders of the Neolithic species. They are our great, great grandparents. It's a historic fact we had a beginning. It's a biological fact that we've only been who we are 10,000 years genetically. It's a climatological fact. We didn't exist until after the end of the Younger Dryas event. And it's an archaeological fact when you begin to trace backwards, and we'll try to touch on some of that next week. When you go back and look at the literary hints that's embedded, there was no Troy, there was no Agamemnon, there was no Clytemnestra, to swim and went looking. There was no Minoan culture, there was no labyrinth until Evans went searching. And when others started looking and quit throwing away the Bible because it's religious and started looking at the first books of the Old Testament as historical documents that contain embedded in them historical memory. They went looking. And when they went looking, they're beginning to find archaeological evidence of all this stuff. I have emphasized this tonight for a reason. Because the first thing that got attacked in my life when I went to college was there was no Adam and no Eve in my required Old Testament religion class. There was no Adam and there was no Eve. There was no Noah. They at least started with Abraham. When I went to seminary to see if there was anything left to believe in in my required Old Testament introduction class the entire book of Genesis there was no Abraham there was there was no Adam there was no Eve there was no Abraham there was no Noah there was no Abraham Isaac and Jacob we threw out the entire book when you look at the new information that exist not theologically but exist biologically, genetically from the climate from the ancient sources such as the Emmer Car and the Lord of Arana who ever heard of it? What in our textbooks? Just recently been discovered and when they discovered it just it's taken a hundred years to get some of the stuff translated and it's got all kind of clues in it that points backwards for us and these people out of the Enlightenment, who wanted to say there is no God and there's only science and claim their victories, don't even know that in their own scientific halls and scientific journals, the new scientists have already thrown out the old. The new microbiologists and the new geneticists and the new evolutionists are coming up with entirely different dates and entirely different answers to all of it. And it doesn't matter what they try to do. I'll put it this way in an argument. The reason they keep coming up with this stuff is they're trying to disprove us. And it's blowing them away 
because they can't get past the 10,000 year ago wall. They cannot get beyond or behind the Neolithic revolution. Whatever was here is a mystery of scratches on bones. This is not. It's us. So whether God created us or whether a genetic virus infected our grandparents is a choice that people make. It has nothing to do with the facts. It's the interpretation of those facts they choose to make. Because we have a beginning. We have a place for a beginning. And we created the Neolithic revolution. These things, I believe, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us, men, mankind, and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made one of us, made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And ascended into heaven. And sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead. Whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. God bless you for your faithfulness week after week, for your willingness to come. I had no idea where this set of series was going to go when I started. I had no idea I'd be putting together 22-page papers every week. And if you're willing to come back next week, so am I. And we'll see where this leads us. It is quite a journey. And I'm glad we're doing it together. So God bless you for your presence and your faithfulness and your encouragement.